All right. So, hello everybody. I am Dr. Dan Scheinman. I'm the Bird Conservation Director for Audubon, Arkansas, State Office of the National Audubon Society, nonprofit bird conservation organization. Uh, bird con Director is a fancy title for ornithologist, which is a fancy title for Birdman. And a lot of people call me Dr. Dan the Birdman. And I love birds, of course. And I also love gardening for birds. And in today's world, with so much going on around us, habitat loss, climate change, and now pandemics, it can just seem so overwhelming. Like, what can we? do to help birds with all this stuff going on around the world? Well, I say we should make changes where we have control, which is our own yards. So how can we make our own yards and make things in our own lives more bird friendly? How can we make our space, our local environment safer and healthier for birds? right now it's spring migration and there are millions of birds that are taking wing to go to their breeding grounds to the north and they're starting to pass over our areas and those birds need places to land and rest and refuel on their long journeys and the birds that breed here need places to find food and shelter the birds of winter here need those same resources our yards can be that haven for those migratory and even resident birds. But the problem is that birds have lost a lot of habitat over time, especially through urbanization. And I'll show you a series of maps here that show how housing density has changed over the decades, with red areas being dense urban areas. And over time, decade by decade, as our cities ha are, have expanded, we've been eating up what was once natural habitat or even productive farmland and replacing it with urban and suburban areas. Acre by acre, parcel by parcel, things have been changing. And this is where we are today. You can see that growth even in Arkansas. If you live in central Arkansas, you can see how it's one big urban corridor from uh, Jacksonville to Benton to Maumel and probably spreading up to Cabot and, and Conway. And Northwest Arkansas is expanding so rapidly. One of my birding friends calls it Northwest Arkansas City. And that growth is projected to increase even more. So bit by bit, birds are losing habitat. We want to stitch that habitat back together for them. Because this is what a lot of that new development looks like. We've all seen it, right? Cut down the trees, take away the fields, put these houses down. Most of these, these yards are mostly lawn, and there's millions of acres of lawn in the US. Lawn is sterile, it's not good habitat, it requires a lot of resources. In addition to lawn, there may be a few ornamental shades, maybe a few ornamental shrubs and flowers, but these yards are meant to be, to look orderly and neat. They're there to be easy to maintain, to celebrate lawn as a status symbol, but they're not there to share our yards with other wildlife. If you were a migratory bird passing over this neighborhood, there's little for you here. You would have to keep on flying. We can change that, right? We can do things to make our yards, no matter what situation we're living in, better for birds. There are things we can promote and there are threats that we can try to reduce or prevent. And I'll go through each one of these in turn. So the first and foremost are planting native plants. Native plants are the foundation of a bird-friendly yard. Native plants are the ones that were here before European settlement. 
Currently, this is the main criteria for choosing landscaping plants, especially in the newer developments. Mostly, is it pretty? Does it look nice in my yard? And as long as it looks nice and it will tolerate the soil, the moisture, the sunlight, I'll plant it, right? But we need to balance that scale and consider the ecological values as well, especially the food web values that the plants provide. And I would argue that native plants provide both ecological and decorative values. They look good and they are functional. And I don't just talk the talk, I plant the plant too. I have an all Arkansas native plant yard. Now, I will admit that I bought my house from an expert botanist, Theo Witzel, who works for Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. He spent eight years before me putting in native plants, converting it to an Arkansas native plant yard. Uh, but I've enjoyed the last nine years maintaining that and adding to it over time. But I'm not saying that you need to, right now, rip out all your ornamental plants and go so completely native. No, no, no. You want to transition. You want to go over slowly over time. <laughs> when you have a choice, choose natives. If a tree dies, replace it with a native. If a shrub dies, replace it with a native. If you're going to build a new garden bed, put natives in there, or plant natives interspersed with your ornamental plants. If you've got roses and rose sharons and zinnias you love, fine, keep them, but do include native plants in your yard and reduce that area that is in lawn and replace it with more garden beds. And in that way, we can each create a little patch of habitat for the birds and help to create these corridors that connect the birds on their long journeys. And the reason native plants are so valuable is that they provide food for the birds. And not just the fruits, the seeds, and nectar that birds have evolved to rely on, but especially the insects. The insects are really the key to native plants. And even more than birds, insects are tied to native plants. Specialization is the key with insects. Most insects can eat only one kind of plant or a limited number of plants. Think about the monarch. Sure, adult monarch butterflies can feed on non-native zinnias and butterfly bush uh, and all sorts of things that we like to plant for them, but monarch caterpillars can eat only milkweeds and not the non-native tropical milkweed, but the native milkweed species. So if you want to have more monarchs, you've got to plant milkweed, and that is the rule in the insect world. And our birds need insects. 96% of terrestrial birds feed their young insects, and caterpillars especially are good for baby birds because they're soft-bodied, they're juicy, they're filled with protein and fat that the birds eat. So even birds where the adults feed on seeds and nectar and stuff, they still feed their young insects. Hummingbirds feed their young insects and spiders. A study done on chickadees found that a chickadee pair feeds, they, they bring to their young 390 to 570 caterpillars per day. 390 to 570 caterpillars to per day to feed a clutch of chickadees. It takes 16 days to fledge the chickadees. So 390 to 570 times 16 is 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars needed to feed one clutch of chickadees. And a chickadee can have multiple clutches in a season, and a chickadee is a tiny bird. Imagine how many caterpillars it takes to feed bigger birds like cardinals or blue jays or a pileated woodpecker. So native plants, again, harbor those insects the birds need. 
A study done on the on plants found that our native oak species in the genus Quercus, they support at least 537 species of caterpillars, whereas the non-native popular ornamental ginkgo supports only four species of caterpillars. So if you're a chickadee trying to find caterpillars to feed your young, the difference between an oak and a ginkgo can mean the difference between life and death for your baby birds. So if you really want to feed the birds, plant an oak, or generally plant native plants. If you want to learn more about planting native plants, if you're not convinced yet, or if you want to convince your friends and neighbors, I recommend two books. One is Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy. He's a researcher at the University of Delaware, and he studied that link between insects, plants, and birds. And that's what his book is about, the science of that, written in a really understandable, relatable way. I really recommend this book. And then there's A New Garden Ethic by Benjamin Vogt. He makes the case more from an ethical, philosophical argument, how we are part of nature, not apart from nature. And it's our responsibility to help nature and to be a part of it and to bring nature to our yards by planting natives. And not only just planting one plant here and there, but actually he likes to promote planting prairies, so diverse ecosystems in our yards. If you want to know what native plants you can find or plant in your area, you can go to National Audubon Society's Plants for Birds website. And there you can type your zip code into this finder and it will give you a list of native plants recommended for your area and also says which species of birds benefit from the plants and then there's also resources where you can find native plants or get help from folks who are experts in native plants. So I recommend going to National Audubon's Plants for Birds page and checking that list out. So the flip side of planting natives is removing the invasive species. Again, if you've got some ornamentals you love, that's fine, but there are some invasives that are commonly found in our yards that are really nasty buggers. And they don't just stay in our yard, they get loose and they invade natural areas. And government and state and nonprofit organizations like Audubon and Nature Conservancy and Game of Fish have to spend a lot of money trying to fight these species because they tend to outcompete the native plants in natural areas and reduce the biodiversity of our natural areas. And you don't want your yard to be a reservoir of spread for more of these, these aggressive plants. So things like Chinese privet and honeysuckle. And yeah, I know they provide food for birds. And of course, that's how privet spreads around, right? A bird eats a privet berry and poops it out somewhere else and the privet grows up. Uh, and honeysuckle, Japanese honeysuckle. Yeah, hummingbirds will feed on that, but there's also a native trumpet honeysuckle that's even better for hummingbirds, and it blooms at just the right time when the hummingbirds arrive. Nine are in full flower right now, and the hummingbirds have just hit Arkansas. And then Nandina, yeah, birds will eat that too, but Nandina is poisonous for birds. It contains hydrogen cyanide. So if birds eat enough of it, they can be poisoned and die. And cedar waxwings are especially susceptible to this because they gorge on berries. You can cut your Nandina berry stalks off before they ripen. And there's also Nandina varieties that don't have berries that are sterile, but still, why not rip that Nandina out and put in a native shrub that's better for the birds and better for the insects? So in addition to planting native plants, there's basic needs you can provide for birds. Shelter and nest sites. Birds need that if you want them to nest in your yard or seek shelter from the elements or predators. And again, native plants provide good cover for birds. There was a study done in the Northeast comparing birds nesting in native versus non-native shrubs. And it found that the birds nesting in non-native shrubs, they had 
lower nest success. It was easier for predators to find the nests in those non-native shrubs because the branching structure was more open, which exposed the nests to those predators. Plants, dead trees, dead parts of trees, if these are not an immediate threat to your house or your neighbor's property, leave them standing. Snags, of course, provide good perches for birds. And of course, there are places where woodpeckers nest. When woodpeckers are done nesting in them, then there's lots of other species that nest in cavities that take up nesting in woodpecker holes or nesting in the natural tree cavities and dead trees. Uh, things like nuthatches and chickadees and titmice and great crested flycatchers. And then, of course, there's all sorts of insects that are eating that dead wood. And that's why there are woodpeckers pecking on that wood. But there is heavy competition for natural wood nesting sites because of people's tendency to cut down standing dead trees. So, the way to supplement that, of course, is through nest boxes. And there's lots of nest box plans out there, different size and shape boxes for different birds. Just be sure if you're going to put your nest box out that you protect the nest box from predators and that you have a way to open up the box so you can clean out the contents at the end of the breeding season. Leaf litter. Leaf litter is another great place for birds to forage. There's a lot of insects that hide in leaf litter. There are some insects that require leaf litter to overwinter. If you want to have insects coming up in the spring, you've got to leave your leaf litter there for the birds to find them. So here's an excuse to not rake, or at least rake less. Uh, what I do in my yard is, um, well, I'll mulch mow the leaves that are on my lawn, and I'll leave the leaves in the garden beds all winter long. And that not only provides places for the insects, it also protects the plant roots from the cold. And it provides nutrients for the soil and it retains moisture and provides compost and uh, protection from weeds, all sorts of benefits of leaf litter. And then come early spring, beginning of February, when the plants are just starting to pop up again, I'll rake that leaf litter out. Not all of it, but the, the heavy stuff. I'll leave a, a layer, a thin layer on the ground, again, to act as mulch and to provide nutrients for the plants and provide hiding places for the insects. And then I love to watch the wood thrushes, the brown thrashers, the white-throated sparrows, the towhees, kicking around in that leaf litter looking for the insects. many of you feed the birds in your yard. That's a great thing to do. Uh, of course, keep in mind that we feed the birds because we enjoy it, not because they rely on our food. Birds that come to feeders regularly are still finding a lot of their daily food sources from native sources, natural sources. Uh, if you are going to be feeding the birds, just be, be a good steward and make sure to keep your feeders clean in order to prevent the spread of disease. So if you see a sick bird, take your feeders down and clean them. If it rains and your feeders are wet, the seed is wet, looking moldy, clean it out. Or even just on a regular basis, every couple of weeks, take your feeders down when they go empty, wash them out. Now some places say use bleach. I don't like bleach, it's toxic to all life. If I really need to disinfect, I prefer vinegar and water, or really just soap and water is all I use most of the time, environmentally friendly soap and water. So I can clean my stuff outside and dump the contents and not worry I'm gonna be poisoning anything. And the same thing with water too. Water is so important, especially in the hot, dry summer and in the freezing cold of winter. Birds need water, birds that would never come to your feeders for seed and suet and stuff. They all need water to drink. So water is a great thing to provide. But again, you want to keep your bird baths clean. Anytime it looks nasty, birds poop in it, you got that green algal growth in it, 
clean it out, scrub it out, put fresh water in, do it more frequently than you clean your bird feed. And we want to remove hazards that birds face. Pesticides are an issue. 80 million pounds of pesticide are applied to lawns in the U.S. every year. And pesticides harm more than just pests. Birds can become sick if they eat insects and rodents that have ingested pesticides. And pesticides also hurt beneficial insects like bees and butterflies. And neonicotinoids are especially bad because neonics are applied to the seed. So when the plant germinates, it takes the neonics into its tissues and it becomes, uh, it becomes uh, plant-wide from the roots to the flowers, to the pollen, to the nectar. It's systemic throughout the tissues of the plant, that neonic, and that is, is deadly dangerous to bees and butterflies. So check plant labels when you're buying in uh, retail stores. Make sure they've not been sprayed with neonicotinoids. Uh, if you're going to use herbicides, pesticides, be sure to use them sparingly. Follow the label, of course. And if you can, really look for more friendly alternatives, like um, there are oils and soaps you can use that are more bird friendly. That may take a little more application to deal with the pest problem, but you're not gonna be harming birds in, in the meantime. And remember, the point of native plants is to have insects. We want to see insects chewing away on our plants, and native plants can tolerate a high degree of insect damage uh, before they suffer from it. Even on the, the milkweeds that we love for our monarchs, we get those milkweed aphids, those orange aphids, the milkweed bugs that are orange, and the, the plant can tolerate that to some degree. So don't worry too much about it. Window collisions are a major threat to birds. Birds can't see glass. They don't know what that is. Instead, they see a reflection of the outdoors and they fly headlong into it and they hit and they die, or they hit, they bounce off, and some of those birds die later on from internal injury. In the US every year, an estimated one billion birds die from window collisions. And it's not just the big skyscrapers that are gigantic towers of glass, it's also our individual homes, where an estimated 150 million birds die through collisions every year. And if you think about it, you know, maybe your home, you see two, three, four birds hit your window in a year, but then multiply that by all the homes in the US and you see it can add up to a tremendous problem for birds. Fortunately, there are easy things we can do to prevent window collisions. And the key is to make the windows more visible for birds, to put an obstruction in the way so they don't think they can fly through. And there's things you can do like putting up strings, cords, decals, stickers. But whatever you do, you got to make sure that those elements are no more than four inches apart from each other. But he's found that birds are willing to fly through a gap of four inches or more. So if you're going to string strings, they got to be no more than four inches apart. If you're going to have stickers up, they have to be in a regular grid, no more than four inches apart. Putting a decal in one corner and a decal in another corner is not going to do anything for you. Now here's a picture of my windows, the ones that face my feeders, and I've got parachute cord hanging there. Uh, that parachute cord, again, is a visible sign. It moves with the slightest breeze. And all I've done is I've, I've put two command hooks, those um, hooks that you can easily remove, two command hooks on either side of the window frame, string a string across those, and then tie the parachute cord off from that at length. And then also you can see in this picture, uh, one of my two cats, but they are indoor cats only. 
And that brings me to the next point, keeping cats indoors. Cats are the number one predator to birds worldwide. Outdoor cats kill an estimated 2.4 billion, with a B, billion birds in the U.S. each year. Cats are efficient predators. They hunt even when they're not hungry. And they not only take a toll on our birds, but also on mammals and reptiles and other little critters. Studies have found that indoor cats live longer, healthier lives. Indoor cats don't get into cat fights. They don't spread diseases. They don't get mauled by dogs and coyotes. They don't get hit by cars. They don't get taken away by well-meaning people who think that they're strays and don't have a home. Take it from a cat lover, keep cats indoors. It's better for the birds, better for the cats. And then lastly, there are personal actions that we can take to help the environment. They're not necessarily directly related to the birds, but they reduce our impact on the environment. So conservation starts at home. Things like reducing energy use, reducing water use, installing rain barrels to capture the rainwater from your roof and using that to water your garden planting your own garden, have a local food, uh, not using pesticides on that, of course. Uh, so think personal actions that we can take at, at home to reduce our carbon footprint, our energy footprint, our resource use. We can also make our bird watching count for the birds by participating in community science programs like the Great Backyard Bird Count and Audubon's Christmas Bird Count and eBird. By submitting our sightings to these science programs, this is how researchers, how ornithologists keep track of bird populations. It's how we know which birds are increasing or de decreasing and how we figure out where we need to help the birds. So these are easy, they're free, and they do help the birds and something you can do each and every day just by watching your backyard birds. And you can also help to spread the bird word. So now that you know more about native plants and making your yard bird friendly, and if you read Benjamin Vogt's book and Doug Tallamy's book, help to share that with your friends and family. Tell them why you think they should make their yard more bird friendly and how they can go about doing that. And if you want a nice sign, a symbol how, that your yard is bird friendly, then I recommend signing up for the Bird Friendly Yard Certification Program from Audubon Arkansas's sister organization, Arkansas Audubon Society. Now, I am also a member of Arkansas Audubon Society, and in fact, I'm on the Bird Friendly Yard Committee that created the program. So, I, by promoting it, I'm actually wearing two hats here. But basically, uh, on the website, rbirds.org, there is the application there, and there's a checklist of things you can do that go through the things that I cover today planting natives, removing invasives, taking personal actions. It points for each of these things that you do. And the more points you have, the more bird friendly your yard is. And you submit your application and you can either be green certified or gold certified bird friendly. And then you get a flag that you can hang in your yard to show everybody that you are indeed a bird friendly yard. But even if you don't have enough points yet to get the green or gold flag, but you wanna start taking actions along that line, still submit your application. Let us know that you are on your way and we'll send you that pink working to become bird friendly yards. So everyone knows what you're up to. So when you start planting natives, people don't get upset about it, thinking your yard is going to the wild and that you are a, a, a visible member of our network of bird-friendly yards in Arkansas. Oh, and also, if you're listening from outside of Arkansas, 
You don't have to be an Arkansan to be certified by our program. Anyone anywhere is welcome to apply and get the bird from the yard sign. So as with much of conservation, think global, but act local and take the actions you can in your yard to make it bird friendly. Thank you. And I will take questions. I'm gonna to go to the chat now and see what is up. If you have any questions, you can go to the chat box. Let's see. Someone asked about yesterday's webinar, the Birding Basics webinar. That is already available on Audubon Arkansas's Facebook page, but also it has been recorded. And after uh, this session and my Thursday webinar, all three recordings will be posted on Audubon Arkansas's website and we'll notify everyone when that is available. Someone asked, uh, when's the best time to clean out bird boxes. So at the end of the breeding season, when the birds are done nesting, that's the time to go clean out your nest box, bluebird or otherwise. And then just before the breeding season starts again, which for bluebirds and a lot of resident birds would be mid-February or so when they start singing and checking out nesting places, check on your boxes again, make sure that there aren't any critters living in them, uh, clean them out and make sure they're ready for the bluebirds. Where's the best place for a bird bath, in the shade or the sun? You know, I, I don't know that it really matters. In the sun, I suppose it does get warmer faster and promotes that algal growth, that green or brown growth that always happens in the summertime. In the shade, that might hold off some. I think just put it wherever it is convenient. Uh, put it where you can see it if you want to enjoy seeing the birds take a bath. Put it where it is near cover so the birds can dart to cover if they think they're being threatened, but not right next to cover so a predator like a cat can't be hiding and jump out and get the wet bird. Oh, my yard is gorgeous, thank you. I work hard on it. Uh, I, I don't want anyone to think that a native plant yard is an easy to maintain yard. Like any yard, it does take maintenance. You got to, I hand pull my weeds um, at the, you know, at the uh, beginning of the growing season. I will cut down the standing dead vegetation. Um, there are native plants I have that are quite aggressive. So I do have to control some of the native plants too, pull them out, pull them back, keep them, uh, keep them in control so I have more diversity. So it's a labor of love though, like any garden. An enzyme solution for bird baths. I, I don't know too much about an enzyme solution for baths. I know there are tablets you can put in them to keep mosquitoes from breeding in your water. But if you're cleaning your bird baths out regularly, then you shouldn't need any additives. But that may be for uh, Wild Birds Unlimited. Let's see, best clean method for bird feeders, I just say soap and water. That's all I really use. Uh, just the other day, I did try putting my in my dishwasher because I was told that they are dishwasher safe and that indeed worked for me. Um, although I then ran the cleaning cycle in my dishwasher after that just to be sure. But um, I just usually hand wash my bird feeders, soap and water and a scrub brush and sponge. And if you're really then a weak vinegar solution. Anything you can do about hawks in the yard. So uh, hawks are a native predator that birds have evolved with. Nine times out of 10, hawks are unsuccessful in their search. I would say that, that it's okay to have hawks taking out birds in your yard. I enjoy seeing the hawks swoop through and take out a morning dove. But if it does distress you, then stop feeding the birds for about two weeks. The songbirds come in for the feeders, the hawks come in for the birds, Stop feeding the birds, they'll disperse, 
The hawks will go elsewhere for food. Someone asked about spiders being bad for hummingbirds. Nope. Hummingbirds love spiders. They totally eat spiders. They will pluck spiders off of the web and eat them, and then they'll take the web and use it to line their nests. So don't kill spiders. Uh, back when I was an undergrad in college, I took a, um, a public speaking course, and I had to give a speech to convince. And my speech to convince was, don't kill spiders. And one of the reasons was because they're good for hummingbirds. Someone asked about the native plant sale that Audubon, Arkansas has. So our native plant sale was scheduled for April 25th at the Little Rock Audubon Center. That is not going to happen. We are working on a, an alternative date that works for our vendors. Uh, I've, we've been holding off and announcing that till we have our ducks in a row. Tentatively, that is June 6th. And we're also considering maybe having drive-through pickup for plants. But stay tuned. We're, we're going to figure that out, I promise. In the meantime, where can you buy native plants? Uh, well, there, if you're in Little Rock, there is uh, River Valley Horticulture in West Little Rock. They've got natives. They know it. Ask them about it. There's also Grand Design in Little Rock. And then there's Pine Ridge Gardens, which is Arkansas's largest native plant seller. And uh, they're based in London, Arkansas, outside of Russellville. And they do have open house days or it's by appointment. I'm not sure what's going on with them right now under the current uh, you know, social distancing conditions, but you can always contact Pine Ridge Gardens at pineridgegardens.com, I believe. Good source for bluebird nest boxes. So uh, I know Wild Birds Unlimited and Little Rock sells them. I would imagine some, maybe some other uh, garden centers probably sell them. There's also easy to use plans online or you can buy a lot of things online these days too. Recommendations for the best plants to start with as you create a plant garden. Um, well, Let's see. Um, well, uh, echinacea, you know, that's coneflowers. They're pretty easy. They're very tolerant of a lot of conditions. They grow very well. Uh, butterfly weed is a really good plant. There, there's so many plants to go into, but again, I would recommend going to National Audubon's uh, Plants for Birds database and looking at those selections of plants. A plant to replace Nandina. So um, let's see, berry producing plants that replace, well, um, uh, beautyberry, beautyberry, AKA French mulberry, produces beautiful purple berries in the fall that birds eat. And it's a very hardy plant. If it gets too big for your area, you can cut it back to the stump and it will come back up again. Beautyberry is a great plant. Oh, someone asked about the hummingbirds and the spider webs again, about hummingbirds getting caught in spider webs. Mm, I'm, that might happen in some cases. I don't know if any of the spiders in our area are big enough to really trap a hummingbird. I know in the tropics, there are some very big spiders that do intentionally get hummingbirds and eat them. Not such a big worry around here. Oh, and uh, my friend at Hot Springs Village Audubon says that they sell bluebird nest boxes from their online store. So you can go to, uh, to hsvbirds.com and buy your bluebird box. And I know they're quality boxes. I've got one. Oh, thank you everyone for other recommendations. Praying mantises do hunt hummingbirds. That is true. Uh, but again, they're, you know, that is life. That's nature. <laughs> birds eat insects, and there are some insects that eat birds. Any other questions?
All right. Well, thank you everybody for your time and attention. And I hope you're excited to get out there and start doing some more gardening for the birds and doing other things reduce the threats that birds face and keep your yard safe and healthy for the birds and the other wildlife that enjoy it. Have a good evening.